Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the Michael Bryan Podcast. I'm your host, Michael A. Bryan, and joining me today, all the way from down under, is Mr. Peter Scott. Peter, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's a pleasure to have you here, Peter. Now, Peter, you and I, we have a wonderful set of things to dive into in terms of our conversation today, and I'm super excited to go there with you. But before we get there, for those of you who this is your first time joining us here on the Michael Bryan podcast, this is a podcast where I bring you interviews and conversations from yoga teachers, mindfulness-based leaders, and healers from around the world who are changing their lives as well as the lives of others through their practices. So if you want to continue to be a part of this momentum that we're building here on the Michael Bryan podcast, please do take a moment, go down below, subscribe to this video if you're watching it on YouTube, as well as share this conversation with your other yoga loving and mindfulness loving friends from all around the world, because more and more people need to hear about these amazing conversations that we're having with these amazing teachers. Now, Peter, once again, I'm super excited to be sitting here with you today because I have we have tangentially been friendly for quite a while over on Instagram. That's correct. Yes, it, it, it's uh, Instagram's really, really a wonderful thing for yoga. I think um, I, more so than some of the other social media because it it allows us to interact quite broadly throughout the whole world. Um, and I got to I got to meet you via Instagram and see your beautiful studio, no longer with us, sadly. But it's, um, it's quite outstanding, the, the range of people you, we can meet in our own fields that we, we haven't actually physically met. So I'm, I'm pleased to have been able to do that with you. Thank you. Definitely. And I remember, I, I had first heard about you. I think that you used to come to practice yoga studio. That's it, yes. Right, yeah. okay. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. I, I remember that there, there was some place, it was either in Florida or it was at practice and they had a workshop with you and I wanted to come over to attend, but I was doing something else that weekend. But I, um, I'm super excited to be here with you right now and really to have this conversation because I've, I've always wanted to sit down and hold space and talk to you. So thank you for being here. It's, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Michael. Um, it, it's... I find podcasts such a such a um, inspiring thing to listen to and be part of. You know the depth that we can get into with a podcast that that is unsurpassed by social media and those quick takes in social media. So it's a it's a real pleasure to be here talking with you. This is so true. Now, Peter, before we dive in, I want you to tell our listeners and viewers a little bit about yourself, actually a lot of bit about yourself, who you are, how it is you came into the specific practice that you practice today, primarily Iyengar yoga, but whatever other things you do around your Iyengar yoga practice, and what has kept you in your practice for all these years? Um, what's kept me in my practice? I think literally practices kept me in my practice. Um, I started yoga when I was 19, back in 77. Um, I went with some school friends. Uh, we did lots of sports together, jogging and basketball and football and things like that, uh, which we kept doing after we finished high school. And a friend said, mentioned to me, oh, you know, you're a vegetarian, you have to come with me to yoga. So I, off we went to a class. Um, and that, so I, I kept going to a class, you know, a couple of times a week. It wasn't Iyengar yoga in those days. Um, and I went traveling in the United States. In Australia, most people have a gap year and they will go to Europe or Asia. And I thought, you know, United States has influenced the world so much, um, both culturally, musically. So I thought I'd go there and I hitchhiked around in Canada and Alaska and the United States and ended up in San Francisco and saw an advertisement for a yoga class on a coffee shop wall. Um, and I, I went to this class thinking it was a yoga class, something of what I was used to, that there would be pictures of, you know, Indian men and chakras and 
holy, you know, incense. And I arrived in this woman's living room, I, I guess not dissimilar to my living room as it is now, which is my yoga studio. And um, it was Leah Howard in San Francisco. And she just arrived back from uh, the Institute and therapy classes. She was a, she was a ballet dancer, I believe, and had injured her back. And she'd just done a whole lot of uh, medical classes with Mr. Ayenga. It was quite a different class. Um, we did all standing poses and inversions and uh, all those things that are so regularly known now in, in yoga. Um, I think standing poses have been, been the biggest kind of turnaround in that period of time in that, what is it, close to 40, it's over 40 years now. When, when I started yoga and I, I did a couple of different classes in different places, we didn't do any other standing pose apart from Garudasana. There were just no standing poses. So it was such a kind of highlight to go to that class. And strangely, I, I found out many years later um, at, at, at one of the yoga nusasanams that Gita was teaching in December a few years ago, I sat with a good friend, Kevin Gardner, and then we both realized that we both attended that first class of Leah's back in 1979. So that was a highlight as well. Um, I didn't get to go to Pune uh, myself until probably nearly 10 years later in 87. Um, after traveling in the United States, I came back to Australia and I studied natural therapies. Uh, I, did, I did that and kept practicing that after graduating in 85. I practiced that for about 10 years or more. Um, I, uh, my focus was herbal medicine. So I used a lot of herbal medicine. Um, I haven't done that for probably 20 years now. Um, yeah, it would be 20 years since I, I last practiced very much in herbal medicine, but it still informs me. It, I still find it helpful using creams and ointments when necessary, you know, with cuts and bruises and any, any injuries that might come up. Um, and I, I guess probably the, the biggest thing that I'm doing in my practice now, particularly in these last five years or more is just sitting, uh, holding a sitting practice. I guess most people call it meditation practice, um, which I didn't tend to do so much throughout those earlier years. Um, at varying times, I've had more and less time to practice and done the classic 70s Iyengar practice of focusing, you know, on a, a series, like all the forward bends or all the back bends or all the standing poses of a morning and then an afternoon inversion practice and probably did that for 15 or 20 years or more. Um, these days, I'm... I'm doing much. I'm doing shorter practices, uh, teaching Zoom classes. Our studio closed three, two years ago now, or one and a half years ago. Um, along with, I think, a lot of the rest of the world, we're using using the screen so much. Um, and I personally find it a lot of it's inspiring. Um, there, you know, there's some, there's some there's some negatives or downfalls or, you know, things I miss, I guess. Um, I miss being in class with people and being able to have a three dimensional view or help them with adjustments and props, things like that. I guess that the advantage of the zoom classes is that people feel more free to stop what they're doing. If something's not working for them and, or do a little bit more if the class is not strong enough for them. And I'm finding that's a, I think that's a bonus. I think that's a good thing. Yeah. I'm really excited by this point you brought up about Zoom. And, and there were several things that you brought up that I definitely want to go in a bit deeper. But this whole thing with the Zoom revolution, you know, the, the new normal, as people have been calling it, I think it's really exciting. And at the beginning, I was a little bit resistant 
about it. Like I think many of us were, but at the same time, we were speaking earlier and I told you that I'm, I'm a Taurus. <laughs> My son is in Taurus. So at the same time, I, I, I deeply enjoy being home and I deeply enjoy being able to do practice, that my fridge is right there, my bathroom is right there, my bed is right there. So there's this comfort that comes from being able to practice in home and still being able to access all of these people who you would have been with or who I would have been with in a regular sort of situation. So for, for you, what has that arc of growth been like in terms of, you know, where all in lockdown and having to figure out the whole Zoom situation? Because I know that it's been a different experience for different people. It, it's certainly a different experience. Uh, you know, apart from all the administrative technological uh, adjustments that I needed a lot of help with, um, I, I had been doing a little bit of, a little bit more time videoing practice for, um, for a group in China. Um, I, I, I work with a group called Yoga Mala in China and they have an online system uh, of videoing. Uh, and there's several Western teachers uh, from UK and United States that work with them as well. So I'd done a little bit of videoing with them in November 2019 and they uh, they released the videos in early January 2020 and then China went into lockdown. And my, a lot of my students then said, thanks, you know, good timing. I, and they just took off the videos. They started practicing with the videos and I got lots of feedback via um, the social media WeChat app. So having done that a little bit then, I think what I decided to do differently to some of my other friends and associates was to make my Zoom class literally like a class as much as I could. So I wasn't just standing and practicing myself with them like a lead kind of practice, but I tried to keep it as close to class as possible. I would give individual verbal adjustments or support um, I'd, I'd be, I was happy if they stopped and asked me questions, those kinds of things. Um, so I tried to differentiate between that idea of a, you know, practice with, practice with the person on the screen and actual teaching. And it, it, it's had its ups and downs. Um, you know, I've had some pretty positive feedback, some ordinary feedback on, you know, I can't see you, why are you moving out of the screen? Um, why are you, you know, some of the recorded classes, why have you got a, a gallery view? Why I need to see you. And so I, I guess there's some ups and downs in that regard, but I still feel more that I want to teach classes as classes um, as, and then try and you have the advantage of recordings as well. And so I think, I think the, the ups and downs or the, the positives and negatives, I, I, let, me, let me say the positives outweigh the negatives. Um, as you said, your Taurian nature of being home, I, I feel a little bit the same. Um, one, of, one of the big things I do find is also not getting on my bicycle or in my car, depending on how far I have to go, um, and into the traffic. And that's been marvellous, not being in the traffic. You know, it's, it's really helpful. Most Walking to the studio was an advantage. Bike riding's cool, but not being out in the traffic's really great. <laughs> Most definitely. Uh, another thing that I wanted to say, just because you mentioned different ways of teaching on Zoom, and I've also navigated or have been trying to navigate this whole thing of, of creating the in-class experience versus more of a... Uh, standing back and practicing with my students experience mm -hmm. and one of the things I discovered just this week is that I can have one of my more seasoned students put the spotlight on that student so that that screen will be filled with just that student practicing and all of the students follow him or her or whomever while I'm 
in the camera. You know, when I get close to the camera, all you can see is my chin and I'm looking and I'm calling people's names. But I found that to be such a convenience to be able to spotlight one person who has an awareness of the shape of the practice so that everyone can follow that person while I'm coming up to the screen and flipping through the pages and giving people one-on-one -on -one, uh, corrections and adjustments. I mean, maybe that can be an option that you play with. Yeah, I think it's a good option. And I, I do like to highlight and spotlight, um, spotlight different students. I, I, it's a, it is a real benefit to be able to have someone who's so familiar with your instructions and worked with you and, and apprenticed with you um, that, and you're their mentor. It, it does make a difference. And I've, I've tend to, I tend to try and use not one person through the whole class, but use individuals at different times, you know, their strengths. Some, some of them are really good in when they're doing back bends and a couple of others are really good in standing poses and, and sometimes it's also I find helpful to to not pick necessarily the 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 most adept student to support me. Um, I've I've been teaching over the last number of years what I call a slow paced class um, in studio. That meant women who were pregnant uh, all the way through to people in their eighties. And so we tended to do, you know, slow paced relied on props. Um, and, and I think that's been a little bit more interesting. Some people don't have yoga props, so they're using their kitchen benches or their bathroom stools for back bends and things like that. And some people have got a whole studio, they're, they're practicing in the studio. And so, so back bends have varied considerably from rope work which I have none. Um, and I think that's, that's personally what I miss are the ropes um, and back bends, particularly with rope work. I, I'm really missing that. So I'm hopeful of getting, some, getting back to the studio at some stage um, or creating a little extra space where I can have a, a ropes set up. That would be really delightful. Yeah. I, but on the whole, I think it's, I think, you know, as the world is changing, so our, so our yoga practice and teaching is changing. Um, the other thing that I've noticed with my classes are that there's less than half of the people are from my local hometown. Um, and many more, and as I, as I'm on it, as I'm on Zoom longer and longer, there seems to be more people coming, doing, doing what, time slipping um time slipping into classes uh so they can watch the recorded versions later on and that's been an advantage i think to be able to to be able to provide that definitely now peter what i wanted to ask you about was something that you mentioned earlier in terms of your your, your background in natural healing therapies and in herbalism as well. Uh, what got you into that? And, and how do you think that that became of benefit for you within your, within your life? Uh, I think again, a, a friend got me into it, a girlfriend. Um, I was, uh, I was hanging out with, she wasn't, she wasn't into yoga so much, but she would go to an osteopath and she would come home with this little bottle of black, not necessarily good smelling herbal mixture that she had to take three times a day, a teaspoon three times a day with her meals. And then I started to smell it a bit more and, you know, taste a little bit. And, I, it, and she seemed to, her energy and vitality seemed to pick up. She was, she did a lot of exercise, not sports, walking and bike riding and things like that. She didn't particularly like yoga. Um, and she would also, the, the guy that she was seeing was an, also an osteopath. Um, her, she was finishing off a, an apprenticeship in gardening. Um, and we would, we would make our own gardens and she would, use um 
uh, what is it when you uh, complementary planting with herbs and we even planted a nettle in the garden once, believe it or not, which, you know, these days now you'd plant a nettle to have the tea, but in those days in Australia, a nettle was a noxious weed. And so anyway, we put it right in the middle and we stacked around a bit like Stonehenge or a circular Stonehenge. And it, to me, that got really exciting. I'm, you mentioned you're a Taurus. I'm a, I'm a triple earth sign in astrology. I love gardening. It was, a, it was inspiring. And I watched her health get better as she visited the osteopath and, and uh, drank her herbs. And I got interested in it. I inquired about it. So I started, uh, I did a couple of little mini courses beforehand in massage, a very brief introduction to astrology um, and a brief introduction to herbal medicine. And, and I liked it and it seemed to complement yoga. Um, so I started that course at what we call in Melbourne, the Southern School of Natural Therapies back in the early 80s. Um, that was a four-year course at that stage. I think it's five years now to, to do it all. Um, and you ended up with, I think the degree didn't, the degree in natural therapies didn't come until I think about eight, 10 years after I graduated. Um, so I had a diploma and um, then they wanted us to make sure that we were um, as, a, as a junior in, in, a, in a clinic. And so we did two or three years in clinic understudying to people that had graduated and practiced for years. I think that the thing that really helped my yoga about natural therapies was the the, the theory and the understanding of that your body innately heals itself. It needs some assistance, it needs guidance, but if you eat well, if you sleep well, if you exercise, you will be fairly healthy and get along well. And of course, then the other side of that was we also studied psychology and counseling through each of those four years. We had a psychology unit, um, subject for four years and we had a counseling subject for four years um, so I think that helped a lot I think what was what I probably would not recommend is doing that as much as that I feel that helped me I feel it also held me back um, from I guess and, and you know maybe I should take those words back um, it helped me back from being a pure Iyengar teacher or practitioner. And the reason I say maybe it held me back was because my understanding of the body was kind of biomechanical, um, massage, neuromuscular technique, um, those kinds of things. And I think that stopped me from fully trusting Iyengar yoga. And when I did like go, all right, well, I'm going to leave this aside and I'm going to just do what I know in yoga and develop that. My yoga got a lot better in that I got to understand me better. I got a better relationship between my body and my mind. It was much less coming from a theoretical physio. There was, I'm not a physiotherapist, but a much, much less kind of biomechanical and anatomical approach. Um, so I think that's why it held me back. And that's perhaps what I would recommend not doing. The way it helped me was because I got, I knew the body quite well in that theory. So that, you know, that kind of double-edged sword, you know, which one's helpful, which one's not helpful, which one's useful, which one's not useful. Um, and how much does that take away from Shraddha, you know, the faith in the practice how much did it take away? I think it took away from my faith in the practice too much early on. Um, so would I recommend doing that? I'm not sure that I'd recommend it um, for that, for those reasons. Yeah. This is a really important point that you're bringing up, Peter, and I'm so grateful that you brought it up because 
I, I too come from a body working background in neuromuscular therapy and I have a massage background as well and an Ayurveda background, which actually did end up serving my Ingar practice. But the other pure Western neuromuscular therapy things that I've done before uh, have been different. The, the, the postural training that I've done before was different. And I think that there's something very specific that occurs within the mind when you come with a proper Western understanding of how the body should work, particularly when you come with a gym understanding of how the body should work. Because when you're in a gym environment, there are certain things that you learn about what you should do with your knees, what you shouldn't do with your knees, what you should do with your arms, what you shouldn't do with your arms that are completely counterintuitive when you move into an Iyengar yoga space. And something that I've been finding, especially with a lot of my colleagues in Iyengar yoga who have wanted to get non-Iyengar complementary training, whether it's in pure kinesiology or anatomy and physiology, or they've even taken personal training courses, is that that knowledge, while it's beneficial in a meta sort of macro level of just knowing the proper anatomical landmarks of the body and all of these things, Iyengar yoga is a completely different sort of world in terms of the internal experience of the body as a field of awareness. And this has, and, and, and this, is, this has been something that I've thought about for a long time because I've studied with Lois, I've apprenticed with Lois, I've traveled around the world with Lois, I've, I've been with Lois in, in her therapy workshops everywhere. And the language within those therapy workshops is very different language from what is used in physiotherapy. I, I, I know this because I, I've worked with physiotherapists in Nassau and when they have trouble with their patients, they send their patients to me because they know that I know how to heal a back or I know how to heal a knee. And it's a very different thing. And to, to the point that you were making, it's easy for me to step into a space of faith in terms of Iyengar yoga because it was so early within my life when I really dug my heels into it. And I've, I think that I've just been in that space. So I, I don't doubt it because I've seen the healing that Iyengar yoga does, especially the therapeutic and the medical aspect of our practice. And when I'm working with colleagues from even other traditions of yoga, who have been trained differently, it's very difficult to penetrate that thick veil of what it is they think they know because that serves as a fundamental parameter to them being able to hear me say, hey, if you straighten your knees, you'll heal your knee pain. Or hey, if you, if you straighten your elbow, you'll heal your neck and shoulders. It becomes a completely different world and I'm so grateful that you said it because it because it hasn't been said loud enough for people to hear and for people to realize that you cannot step into Iyengar yoga with the apprehensions and with the parameters that you've placed on yourself based on your previous knowledge because the practice it, it will not work if you force it to fit within your paradigm of how the body should be. I, I, I agree with you 100% and I love some of the terminology that you said, you know, it may help the macro, but it definitely doesn't help the micro. And it, and it, it's a, you know, let, let's come to it. It's a conditioned mind if you come in with those, with those learnings. And so for me, I had to uncondition that. I had to, I had to decondition it. And, and I guess that's part of Viragya. Um, Viragya, you know, to decondition the previous learning and come back to an open mind, an open space. And I think the other thing you, you mentioned was that sense of ability to straighten arms and legs. Um, but the sensory perception is a completely different aspect uh, within. And I, I, I think, you know, when I listen to Mr. Iyengar, when I listened to Guruji in the past, you know, he talks about you've got a conditioned mind. And then he says, well, you've got to condition the mind. And it's like, it took me a long time to realize that the difference between conditioning it with practice and deconditioning those precepts and concepts and 
education so-called of of my previous experience and i think that really takes it into what what i find his way of teaching spirituality um you know he 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 often talked about other teachers not degradingly but to to help us learn what is a conditioned mind what is a non-conditioned mind what is an habituated mind what is an ha- what is habit and what is practice uh and abhijata gave a great talk 10 years or so ago about that um when he was still alive he, she spoke for 45 minutes or something uh with notes in in that modern way that we we were not allowed to do with guruji we had to learn if we we're going to talk we had to learn not to use notes so he he got a little softer with his granddaughter i think um but then he stood up and addressed every single almost paragraph i think that she mentioned in her talk that night he got up and remembered it and this is a guy who's it was 2010 so you know he's he's 88 years old and he remembers a talk that goes on for 45 minutes and answers each of those questions and comments that she'd made um and i guess what i'm saying there is you know i think yoga really works it works incredibly well it worked for him it can work for others because it's it's about the it's about getting involved in your own practice shedding those layers of of doubt and shedding those layers of misconception um and as you say it it's it's about yourself isn't it it's about your own practice your own internal being so it it's inspiring to talk to you well i'm deeply inspired to be having this conversation with you as well and as i listen to you and what you're saying what stands out for me is something that i think has been happening in iyengar yoga probably for forever but it's something that i really noticed i dare say in the last 4 years or so where there's this movement within the non iyengar yoga community to take iyengar yoga concepts and to take iyengar yoga language and package it as something that isn't iyengar yoga but it essentially is because they took that one workshop with that one senior teacher one time and so they think they got a concept or they took that one week long intensive with somebody else at their studio so they think they understand it and what i what i see oftentimes is that they aren't able to take that information and really root it within their practice in an all encompassing way where that information can be nurtured because the greater shape of their practice isn't iyengar yoga and i remember when i first met my mentor lois and she and i were having the same conversation she said to me you know you can take as many drop in workshops as you like with as many senior teachers from around the world but if you aren't a certified iyengar yoga teacher there's no way that you could hold that information within you because the greater shape of your practice isn't that so it's like you're trying to force a thing to fit on the top of something that doesn't really hold it and at the moment i thought it was a money making scheme and i thought she was just trying to get me to to study with her and so i could spend up all my money my life saving studying iyengar yoga but when i became certified i got it i got it because as i looked around me afterwards i realized that the people who were practicing iyengar yoga on the fringes they their their practice didn't have a way for them to hold this information and their bodies didn't have a way for them to hold this information so yes they could speak the iyengar yoga language because it sounds amazing you know lift the skin of the back of the thighs move the inner groins back spread them to the sides and lift them up i mean there is this there's this beautiful internal somatic poetry that you step into when you practice iyengar yoga but if you aren't really plugged in and rooted into this practice 
you, you, you don't have that, that receptacle within you. Mr. Iyengar, he speaks about it in Light on Yoga, where he talks about pranayama and how the body has to be hardened and baked and made sharp like a thunderbolt through your asana practice so that you could receive that universal life force energy that is the prana from the, through your pranayama practice. And in a similar manner, I find that when people don't have this baking of Iyengar yoga as their foundation, that information, those words come out of their mouths, but it, it, it comes from a place that's purely cerebral because they haven't internalized this, this practice and the beauty of this practice into their physical body, their minds and their hearts. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you, Michael. I, I agree with you and I, I also agree with your mentor, Lois. Um, and I think one of the things you mentioned earlier was your Ayurvedic studies and how they have helped. And I, I believe um, would have helped considerably because it, it did take me a long time. I, I did some um, individual that we didn't have any Ayurvedic practitioners here back in, in Melbourne, in Melbourne here back in the eighties. Uh, there's lots now. Um, but I think the amount of, you know, those, those poetic instructions that you were describing and lift the skin on the back of the thighs and how that supports your internal Ayurvedic yoga physiology, your, your, the, the five pranas, the instructions in Iyengar yoga, it took me a long time to realize were to support the, the balance of uh, Udana and Apana. They are, they are involved, intricate and intrinsic to the, the instructions that were given by the three main teachers, uh, Guruji and Gita and Prashant. And it, it took a long time to even understand if they're talking about Muladhara Bandha, they're talking about tailbone and they're talking about pubic bone. They're not talking about perineums and muscles and I, because I can do this, I can do a handstand. They're not saying any of that. You know, the, the subtlety of talking about bones when it relates to the element of earth is, is kind of lost uh, on the greater public but not lost for Iyengar yoga teachers. I find some of those, those intricacies that we've been taught and, you know, kind of at varying times drilled into us, taught to us, explained to us patiently with uh, talks like Gita's talk uh, way back on Guruji's 70th birthday about Ayurveda and yoga. It, it's, it's fundamental, as you say, to be cooked, to be baked, to have the, the shell prepared to merge deeper with those koshic layers. Years ago, I wrote, I wrote an article for a magazine in Australia, which subsequently they kind of moved me over into asana. And they said, write, a, write an article on alignment. And I said, okay, alignment starts with the koshas. And I described physical, so on, a little, a little bit theoretical, but then I described how we practice with them. And the editor of the magazine, the yoga magazine, took it to his yoga teacher, who was a Hatha yoga teacher, and she said, that's not possible. And so my, sadly, my article wasn't published. So about 10 years later, Light on Life came out and I showed him Light on Life. And he said, oh, I'm very sorry, I should have published that article. <laughs> which is a shame because I think, you know, a light on life is a, is a layman's language of what we do in Iyengar yoga. It, it's a, and it's based on koshas. It's based on the internal path. And I think we kind of overlook that at times, sadly, to our detriment. <laughs> It's very true. And there's a, a video of Mr. Iyengar teaching, and he was teaching Adol Mukushmanasan to Abhijata and Patricia Walden on stage. And he threw out a statement. And when I heard this years ago, it completely gave me pause because I realized that the speed with which he was speaking, probably the people in the audience didn't understand what he was saying. But he was talking about the hands and he was saying that there should be a perfect balance on the hands between Venus and the moon. And I was blown away 
because the mound of Venus is here, the mound of the moon is here, and I don't know who would have been able to understand what he was saying if they didn't come from an astrological background or a palmistry background or whatever sort of, of complementary spiritual background you'd have to come from in order to know where the mound of Venus and the moon are. But it made me realize in that moment that he had done all of these studies. He knew about the koshas. He knew about the values. He knew about the chakras. He knew about Vedic astrology, like all of this represented the larger spiritual field in which his own abilities were cultivated. And so when we hear this concept of a Iyengar yoga being alignment, that is really a radical reductionistic view of what we do. And when I see non-Iyengar yoga practitioners who are teaching Iyengar-esque yoga in the world, when they speak, it comes out as just being alignment. And you can hear that the information they're giving and the way they're speaking, it only leads you to Anamaya Kosha. It doesn't take you into that deeper, systematic, mystical heart that is Iyengar Yoga. And perhaps when we speak as Iyengar Yoga teachers, it sounds just like alignment. But I think that the students who stick with us over the years, they get it. And they realize that when you ask, for that skin of the back of the thighs to move away from the from the hamstrings, or when you ask for these very specific sort of things in Iyengar yoga, you're orienting the practitioner to their inner world. And the practice of Iyengar yoga has this ability to absorb you and take you into that inner world because you're you're essentially practicing from the core to the periphery and back again. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's such a... It's such a beautiful expression from the core to the periphery and from the uh, from the periphery to the core. And, and the languaging uh, of instructions supports that so solidly right from the first instructions in Light on Yoga. And while some of those may vary and we may never do some of those variations again, they are still pertinent to our practice. They are still pertinent to our consciousness, to our learning and to our ability to move forth in the world. And I think, I think you've, really, you've really explained that very well, Michael. It's, it's, it's a shame that uh, it's gotten reductionist. It's, it's not a surprise um, or, or even a shock um, that things that we, we were introduced to gradually over the years, um, restorative yoga the first time I went was quite late compared to some of my friends and associates was 87. We didn't do any restorative yoga. We did some forward bends, five, five minute forward bends, but we didn't do really any kind of lying back. And then shortly next year round, we're lying back. And now restorative yoga is a separate entity of yoga and you do teacher training in restorative yoga and you must place the prop like this. And it's kind of, I think so much of that is sadly so lost and particularly I, I guess Lois must feel almost devastated I guess I'm, maybe I'm putting my own words onto Lois but um, I, and I don't mean to do that but you know the, the amount of work that Lois has put into her therapeutic books and how widely spread they are and then people read that book and all of a sudden they're a therapist and they've taken those books into other yoga, whatever that may be, sadly, and, and using her work to reinforce, to reinforce yoga that's not really as deep and as thorough as what she's presented. You know, she studied a lot with Guruji and Gita, and I'm sure the only things that went into those books were verified by Guruji and Gita beforehand. Um, and, and it's a, I think, you know, to have Lois as your mentor is, must be incredibly uplifting because of all that work she's done. It's, I, I find it uplifting and I'm, you know, I don't know Lois all that well. I've got, I certainly spent time with her when we're in India and eating meals together and things like that. But I, I find her work quite uplifting and it's, it's a great support to many of my students, uh, particularly in China where there seems to be a lot more trouble with 
menstruation and energy and, you know, they have a lot more stress and they're busier in some ways in China. But introducing some of those books and practices within the practices that I was giving them. So if, instead of giving them regular Supta Varasana, we give them the Supta Varasana that helps soften and quiet and their menstruate, you know, their, their belly and their menstruation. And then they, they're like, oh, this is fabulous. Can I get more? You know, so here's Lois's book, buy the book, and then we can start to do more practice. And it, it's been a great support to me as a teacher trainer and as a teacher to have her books there to be able to work with women as a male um, with, a, with a female mentor. So please pass on my best to Lois and say thank you again. I most definitely will. And this is something that she and I have spoken about, this concept of Iyengar yoga moving into non-Iyengar spaces. And it's a really big topic because when I had first started teaching she knew everything that I was doing. So she knew when I started to do my, my minor ailments, my common ailments clinics in the Bahamas, because I'd send her pictures of all of my students and we'd have conversations about it. So at no point in my practice was I ever unsupported or did she not know how my practice was developing or who my 85 year old student was or when he had his surgery. It was this deeply integrative relationship to my mentor that has really nurtured me and I started to teach Iyengar yoga in non-Iyengar spaces. And I asked her, I said, hey, Lois, how do you feel about this? And she hands down, said to me, and I'll, I'll, I'll give like the, the, the publicly appropriate version of what was said, but, but she said, Michael, like, why would you invest your time in those spaces? And I didn't understand it at that time because in my mind, Everyone should have Iyengar yoga. This knowledge is so amazing, you know. I, and I remember my retour to her was because everyone menstruates <laughs> and because everyone has knee pain, Lois, not just Iyengar yoga people. And everyone has back pain. So I should be able to go to California and teach everyone the, the stuff, like teach non-Iyengar yoga people this information. And she said, well, Michael, if you want to waste your time, then that's on you. But, you know, as for me, I've already done my, my, my trudging and I, you know, I, I left defiantly and I said, yes, I'm going to waste my time. And so I, I'd go out into the world and teach these workshops in these non-Iyengar spaces. And then a year later, I go back and nothing was different. No, that's the difficulty. And the, and the practice was essentially the same and there's a part of me that feels as if what I did was still to some benefit but the main point that she was making was Michael you should just invest yourself in your people and help them to grow because those are the people who have the ability to hold on to the information and to allow it to blossom into something in their lives and years later I, I honestly I, I'm still of the persuasion that everyone menstruates and that everyone has knee pain and back pain. But at the same time, I can feel within my own body now how, especially after 2020, how happy I am to have spent a year on Zoom just teaching people who understand how to receive the teachings that I'm sharing and growing with those people over the space of the year and seeing Iyengar yoga, something that we've always felt had to be this tactile thing, seeing people who've never studied with me before, but who are now studying with me for their first time and who've stuck with it for a year, seeing how this Iyengar yoga has been transferred to them through the screen. And not just your back leg is straight and your front knee is bent in Virabhadrasana too, but this essence of Iyengar yoga that goes beyond that alignment, it's, it's this non-tangible thing within Iyengar yoga that I think we have as Iyengar yoga practitioners and teachers that can't be replicated if your mind is only caught within the shape of a pose, that your leg should be straight and this knee should be bent. It's this other thing. And I've seen students via Zoom being able to have that light on yoga within their lives. And it's so meaningful to me, but I also know that they have that because they've stuck with this system and only this system during the entire year. It, that, that, that commitment to, to the process is, is an extraordinary commitment. 
Um, it, it, and it, I think it, it's a, it, it allows us to flourish. To, it, it gives us nourishment. It supports us through difficult times. Um, and I, I understand what you're saying, you know, every, every woman menstruates and, you know, until they don't, when they're older, but, but I, I, I do feel a little like yourself. Um, and I have had that same experience or similar experience as yourself, you know, where you go and you teach and you, you're going somewhere regularly to teach and the, the, the person who's sponsoring you or helping you to go there is very keen and they're trying to learn and they're trying to do their best. Um, and yet other influences keep coming in. And I, I, I think, you know, it's, it, I used to think, is it worth it? You know, and very much like, am I really, am I wasting my time doing this? Am I wasting their time doing this? But I think occasionally what happens is one or two of those people that you went to California with might not necessarily come back to you, but they will go to another Iyengar teacher and then they will get deeper into it and then they will get that, that aspect of faith in the process. And I, I'm kind of, you know, hopeful and um, intent, I guess, on trying to help that happen. Um, and I, I do also have this other aspect of not, you know, of, God, of all paths lead to heaven, for want of a better description. And I, I did read a, a book by a non Iyengar teacher, Richard Freeman, who's a very famous Ashtanga teacher. Um, and I, I really loved his book in a lot of ways. Um, and I guess probably the, the, intro, the introductory section of his book was about digging holes in your, in your backyard. And, you know, you can dig a little hole and then go dig another little hole and another little hole and another little hole until you dig, start to dig down into one hole and make it very deep and very big. You're not really going to get anywhere. And I think that's that's the commitment that we're after in a practice that we surrender to that practice we have faith in that practice and we give it all and that doesn't mean you give your whole life away and give up your you know your children and your grandchildren and and, and your friends and your lovers and things like that it means committing to the practice on a physical mental and i think um, i think the most important one is emotional level and I couldn't quite understand why Guruji used to say yoga is an emotional subject, but I think I get it now. It, it, it requires an investment of myself into it, my emotion into it. And I think that's when you get the most, as, as you referred to it, that's when you get the most light coming back when you offer that commitment to it. So I, I think that's, yeah, I, I think that's a really wonderful part to what you're talking about, that, that consistency in practice and that, uh, that commitment. Hmm. It's that surrender piece that you spoke about that I feel we're so deeply faced with Nyingar yoga, those of us who choose to become certified Iyengar yoga teachers and then do the work after that to feel the integrity of holding that title, whether it's continuing to study or whether it's consistently practicing ourselves. But Iyengar yoga, I think it, it forces all of us into this space of singularity of intention. And that space is a space of surrender it's like you know you've done all of that work that you've done before within all the other systems of yoga that you practiced now are you willing to stand at the threshold of this practice and realize that nothing that you've learned before can move beyond this threshold or nothing that you've learned before you can take with you into the space where this practice will take you and are you willing to humble yourself in that way and leave behind all of your previous knowledge. There's a, I, when I was studying Vedic astrology, because I, 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 I 
have studied many branches of astrology, say for probably Chinese and Mesoamerican. But when I was studying Vedic astrology, I reached out to these teachers in India, one teacher in particular, and I said, you know, I am a level three NCGR certified astrologer, and I am the third person in the world to receive this advanced certification from this astrologer and all of these things. And I want to learn Vedic astrology. And he said to me, put aside all of your advanced knowledge, begin from the beginning and go from there. And I think Iyengar yoga does that to people in a way that in the beginning, it feels very uncomfortable because the, the person who has been practicing Ashtanga yoga for 20 years doesn't feel as if they need to be in the beginner's Iyengar yoga class. But that is where you learn this language. And if you're not prepared to be humble in that way and to leave behind all of your previous knowledge, then, then you block yourself from that Amrita or that, that golden mead or that honey that really infuses the heart of this practice. So I love what you said about, about surrendering because I think nothing else in my life has brought me so starkly in the front of this concept of surrender and completely surrendering than Iyengar yoga. And it, surrendering brings such benefit, such humility. Um, and I, I think, you know, not, not to make your pose necessarily better or straighter or stronger, but, but to have that aspect of surrender, that aspect of humility does just take you so much deeper into the practice. And I love your terminology of the ambrosia, Amrita. Uh, that's the only way we can get anywhere is through surrender and humility. And it, it's, um, it's not that easy at times. It's not so easy. And to, to, I guess for me to have now lost, and I, I felt the loss of Gita G hu huge in, in my, for my yoga. She, I, I always considered her my teacher, Guruji the, the genius and Gita the teacher who explains all the genius. And it, um, I found it such a loss and I such a loss in, in those ways where if I was beginning not to be so humble or not to be able to surrender so much, she would just point it out rather forthrightly, subtly, uh, succinctly at times. Um, and I, I think the difference now is, is more tricky in that regard to not have a, teacher means I have to walk on the precipice of, of the practice with a sharper mind. Um, and so I, I, I struggled with that loss of Gita for, for, that, for that, struggled immensely with that for that first year, having, thinking, well, who's going to tell me when I need to get off myself or, or you know, to, to, to step back and to be clearer and to notice more. Um, but since then, you know, a, a year or so later now, a couple of years later to work on that threshold of, uh, uh, to, to, to hold that space, I guess it is, is becoming clearer. Um, it does make me marvel at how well Gita and Guruji did that for all those years. It does really, yeah. Definitely. And, you know, I think to, to your benefit and to all of our benefit, when we plug into this practice of Iyengar yoga, we're plugging into a, a field of safety, essentially, and not even just safety because the practice is safe or because we know about alignment or we know what to do with that prop or we know what to do if you have high blood pressure. I mean, th there is that, but I think the greater safety of plugging into a practice like Iyengar yoga is that because it's built on the back of a genius, it's built on Mr. Iyengar's lifelong practice, Gita's lifelong practice, Prashant, Abhijata, and all of these people who feed this well of Iyengar yoga, when you plug into that and you teach what it is you have within yourself with integrity and with sincere earnestness, 
there, there's, there's this magical non-tangible thing that creates this net of safety for you, where you know that you will be held, but it also creates a net of safety for your students where they know that they're stepping into something that isn't just represented by you, but they're stepping into a larger field of experience that has an ancestry and that has a history and that has roots. And so, I mean, I think that we all benefit from the work of the Iyengars and the people who carry on that legacy, even if our teachers' teachers aren't there or even if our own teachers aren't there because this, this practice is built in a way where if you practice it with integrity and if you practice it sincerely and if you, you watch your students while you're teaching and teach for them from the integrity that's within you, you will be held and everything that you offer will be blessed by the purity of your own heart. So I'm, I'm super happy to hear that you're holding yourself in that space on that sharp edge, that, that, that precipice as you call it, because you're, you're in safe hands, even if those hands still aren't in the material realm. Beautifully said, Michael, really beautifully said. And as you, as you said, there is that, that net of previous work that's, that's holding us and allowing us to, to grow within and to help our students in their own process of growing as well. Yeah, beautifully said, well done. Peter, this has been an amazing conversation to have had with you this evening. And um, well, it's evening for me. It's, it's, it's morning for you. No, mid <laughs> midday, uh, middle of the afternoon. Sunshine. Uh, well, this has been an amazing conversation to have had with you. And I'm so grateful to have spent this time. And before we leave, I just want for you to tell our listeners and viewers where they can find you online if they want to dive into some of your wonderful classes how can we uh, study with you and practice with you and tell us where we can find out more about you thank you michael um currently i've got a website being constructed and that should be up um hopefully within a month from now which would be february mid-february 2021 um i'm on Instagram as Peter Scott dot yoga and uh, similar on Facebook at the moment. I've got a good friend who does all those posts for me. Um, luckily, because I'm, I'm not all that technologically minded. Um, so either of those Instagram or Facebook and soon to have a website up and running. I, I really like to say thank you, Michael. It's, it's been a really wonderful experience and uh it's it, it's it's been a delight because it, it's there's nothing really better to talk about than our practice and and how enjoyable that is personally and then i hear from yourself and about lois and all your students so i, I find it a uh, a growing experience to learn of other people's practice and teaching thank you very much for having me on your show well, thank you so much for being here, Peter. It was definitely a pleasure and a privilege to have you here. And I, I can't wait to participate in the beautiful work that you're creating in the world. So thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. And to our listeners and viewers out there, we haven't been on as a podcast yet for a hundred episodes but i'm going to speak it into existence so if this is your hundredth time joining us here on the michael bryan podcast or if this is time number one i just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for continuing to come and share in this amazing wonderful and soulful space with us i appreciate you and your support so if you want to continue to support the show please do share this episode with your other yoga and mindfulness based friends so that more and more people can know about the amazing work that's being done around the world by these amazing teachers like peter scott so until next time i'm your host michael a bryan leaving you in peace and love and hope until we meet again have a good one Bye bye Peter Scott. Hey, Michael. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs>